Okay, we'll call the meeting to order of the City of Seal Beach City Council meeting on uh, January 9th, 2017. Uh, would you please join me in the pledge? I pledge allegiance. Can we have the roll call, please? Mayor Masalabic. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Verapapa. Here. Councilmember Deaton. Here. Councilmember Moore. Here. Councilmember Siskarsik. Here. All present. Good. And welcome to our two new council people. Enjoy your first meeting. Uh, this is uh, by motion of the City Council. This is the time to notify the public of any changes to the agenda and or rearrange the order of the agenda. Does the City Council uh, want to uh, move anything around? Pull anything? Okay, so... Oh. Um, I'll pull G. G. And J. Anything else? Mayor Maslavit, if I could read into the record that we received communications from, um, we received several communications. One was from Robert Goldberg that we received today regarding items D, G, and J. There was an email communication which I sent um, through the City Council after receiving correspondence from Gary Miller regarding the minutes. And there was an additional email from Gary Miller regarding the minutes. If you'd like any changes to the minutes, you can reference either of the um, correspondence received if you prefer to make changes to the minutes. And Or we can do as revised since you've revised them? Correct. Okay. And if anyone wants to see comments from um, the couple of people that were mentioned, you can see the city clerk in the morning and... She'll be glad to make a copy of those comments for you. <clears throat> okay, uh, we will move on to presentations. Our peer fire update. Steve? David, rather. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, as, as was such in the last meeting, there's really not too much to report at this point. Uh, we, are, we still have a bunch of contracts out for design work, uh, structural design, utility line work design, and electrical designs. Uh, I've been coordinating and working with the consultants. They're all underway working on that. We're getting close to finalizing uh, our environmental documentation. And once we get both of those near completion, we'll be able to uh, finish uh, Coastal Commit application, have that uh, finalized with the Coastal Commission, and hopefully wait for a very, very quick uh, meeting. But that's where we stand right now, if anybody has any questions. Okay, great. Any questions? Mayor Maslow, I have a question. Um, I've been getting a lot of questions about the pier. I'm sure a lot of other people have too. And um, I think um, if it would help if you can kind of give us a description of how the end of the pier is right now. Is there still a hole at the end of the pier? Or is it still being worked on? Are people out there working? Is it still in the emergency mode? Or what phase are we in at, at this time? Uh, thank you. That's a great question. Uh, right now, there yes, there is still openings through the decking towards the water below at the end of the pier, but it is, it is fenced off at the very end and has been and will continue to be until we can uh, until we can continue with construction. The Coastal Commission has, in essence, told us that the emergency part of the work, the demolition and other emergencies, uh, in their description is concluded, and they require us to secure a full coastal development permit before we can proceed with any kind of uh, further construction at the end for the new utility lines and the new uh, the decking. So at this point, there's no way to move that fence line up or further deeper onto the pier, or can you move, do that, or is where the current line is? Well, the, the volume line, that's it. I mean, kind of. Uh, 
I'd say the majority of the pier is open during the day, right. all yeah, the way towards the end. A number of times. But yeah, from that uh, from that last fence, there's maybe you can't go another 20, 40, 30, 50 feet. Or? It's probably about 100 feet to the opening, but there's still some structural nuances beyond that fence that it would be uh, it would be much safer in the, the city's mind to keep it That'd at that location. To go further. I think um, if you could, um, maybe for the next meeting, um, have some pictures, if you could do that. And, and maybe give us a timeline, uh, maybe a desired or realistic timeline with the Coastal Commission, not, because um, I think the timeline you had, it was how many months? I don't want to misquote you, but it was a it, year. It, it, it something was a, that, yeah, it was a good amount. Oh. And, and to talk to people like that is, it's not very, you know, good on our part because it seems like it's, you know, someone else's issue. But I think we should put a realistic timeline. And then as that timeline moves on, we have, you know, the reason why it's not, not a proposed reason. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? It, it does. It, it's very difficult to to narrow down Coastal Commission on right. any kind of permit because we've had permits in the past that have been, approved within a couple of months and some that have taken years. Right. It's, I understand that. If, if, I, I just worry about putting a specific timeline and then without knowledge of how but they want to is there a act. reasonable timeline you could do or, I mean, is it just a year and a half, that's it? You know, I mean, it's something to think about. But I think the pictures would, would um, add a lot of value to meetings like this and to the public just to have that. And if you can do something like that for the next meeting. It would help. And sure, I can gladly bring pictures back and uh, yeah, revise the good. timeline to get as up-to-date information as possible. I know you've possible. done a lot of work, and I, I think it shows in the pictures. I've you know, toured it myself, and I think the pictures would say a lot. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. The Orange County Fire Authority is here. Chief, would you like to make a presentation? Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Ken Cruz, uh, Division Chief, Orange County Fire, and uh, serve as your Fire Chief. Uh, tonight, I'd like to just present to you um, some of the most significant changes that uh, we're making to our service delivery system in well over a couple of decades and um, how it's going to benefit the citizens of Seal Beach. Um, we're going to be making some uh, reason, uh, regional enhancements, and um, in that is uh, reconfiguring the units that we have here in the city. So I'm going to go through a presentation here and uh, follow along. So we started this effort uh, two years ago. This will be the third phase of, uh, of our um, emergency service delivery enhancement program. And the goals are um, obviously to uh, improve the level of service and firefighter safety, but we also want to reduce our response times. And uh, we want to uh, decrease the number of responding units. One of the most common complaints we get is, why are there so many pieces of equipment that have to come to my house for an emergency? Um, we want to increase the depth for a second call coverage. So um, very often um, within uh, Leisure World, uh, we will have two calls simultaneously. So we wanted to increase that depth of coverage. And then um, also trying to decrease our uh, need for help from our partner agencies. Um, we do grab a lot of assistance from Huntington Beach, from Garden Grove, and um, they've uh, asked for some help from us to, to kind of decrease that as well. So uh, we'll go through here and see how this is going to go through. So first I just want to start with, uh, this is kind of how uh, our uh, engines are set up right now within the city. Engine 44, right next door here, is a paramedic assessment unit. So it's three persons on the engine, and one of them is a licensed paramedic. Um, the other engine that we have, um, uh, engine 48 on the other end, has three persons also but has no paramedics on it. So we, they are all EMTs and um, within the County of Orange, um, the paramedic service is provided through the fire service. So the way we get um, that paramedic level service, uh, we have to have two persons to make a paramedic team per uh, County EMSA standards. So we have to bring the medic van out of medic uh, station 48, and that has two licensed paramedics on it. So it requires two pieces of equipment to, to come every time we have a medical aid in the city. Our current criteria uh, is seven minutes, 20 seconds. I'll uh, break that down for you. But if you look at the middle one there, um, the, uh, the 10 minutes, that's, uh, that's the one we're gonna focus on here to have two paramedics arrive on scene. And then for our structure fires, uh, nine minutes and 20 seconds is our standard. 
So the way we break this down is uh, we allow one minute for the call processing time. When you pick up your phone, dial 911, and the dispatcher takes the information. Another minute and 20 seconds for the folks in the station to get the call, get to the rig, figure out where they're going, and get moving. And then five minutes drive time. So that's where our seven minutes and 20 seconds comes in. Um, currently, um, the reason this is uh, all possible now that wasn't before is because it's going to be a regional enhancement. So you can see here um, we've got our stations, 44 and 48, but also we're going to make improvements uh, in Los Alamitos and Cyprus, and as well as Buena Park. So that's what's going to allow this whole system to work. This is the current configuration of our units. So you'll see our two in the city up top, 44 and 48. So we talked about we got the PAU engine, the BLS engine, and the paramedic van. So there's eight firefighters on, day, uh, on duty each day here in the city. Uh, but we also grab assistance from Los Alamitos and from Cyprus. Uh, so in the region here, there's a total of 16 firefighters. And we'll come back to that in, um, when we see the revised. Um, paramedic uh, Medic 48 there, you'll see they run about 3,600 incidents a year. That's about 10 a day that they're running on that van. So they're busy, busy, busy. So each, each of those calls lasts at least an hour. So you can see uh, how busy they are. But about 80% of the calls are right here in the city. So that's good for us. Uh, the other 20, um, they'll roll into Los Alamitos and other jurisdictions. So what we're going to do is take those two paramedics from the medic van and place each one of them on one of the engines. And through this, though, we're going to end up with two paramedic units instead of one, because each engine will be a paramedic unit. Medic 17, we actually grab a lot of help from the medic unit in Cyprus. And so you can see they're at 3,400 calls a year, so another very busy medic van. But we're going to do the same thing uh, with Medic 17, though. And we're going to take those and put one on the engine in Cyprus and one in Los Alamitos. And so all of those will assist us here. And we'll see how that works. So when it's all finished, each engine will now be four persons instead of three. And there's going to be two paramedics, two licensed paramedics on each engine. So th there won't be a need for a second unit to come in. As soon as they get there, they are meeting the county EMS standards for paramedic level care. So when we're finished, uh, those same 16 firefighters will look like this. And you'll have four paramedic units instead of two. Our current uh, model right now, these are from our 2015 statistics. In meeting that two paramedics on scene within 10 minutes, you can see green is good, red is bad. So you can see where we're meeting our goals in getting those two paramedics on scene within 10 minutes currently. So up here, um, we do pretty well because we can see this, this area is sandwiched between those two paramedic units. But down here, we struggle. Um, we actually have to get assistance a lot of times from the city of Huntington Beach. So with the, con the configuration changes, this is what it's going to look like. And it's because regionally uh, we're able to increase this level of service that um, the, uh, the computer modeling is showing us that this is what's going to happen. Now, this is computer modeling. However, um, like I said, this is phase three of our program. So phase two, we tackled the cities of Irvine, Lake Forest, Mission Viejo, and Santa Ana. And within that, this is what our results were after our first year of study. Um, with Lake Forest and Mission Viejo, uh, our response times went down 29% and 28%. We were anticipating about 10%. So we were really pleased with this. Um, total between those four cities, you can see the average was about a 20% reduction. So a minute, almost a minute and a half in ALS response time reduction. And we're expecting the same here. We don't anticipate anything different in our results. This is our third phase, and the first phase was just as successful down south. Um, here's a, an, a great example. So this was just like we were talking about in Lake Forest. Th they had the same van and engine configuration, went to medic engine. This is what it looked like before. This is what it looks like now. So we're really excited about this because, like I said, we went from uh, 859 down to 620 in there. Uh, as far as firefighting, and that's just the EMS side of it. So firefighting for us, uh, we do have um, OSHA rules that we have to follow like every other 
agency out there. And there's a policy called two in, two out. So every time we send two firefighters in, we have to have two, fires out, two firefighters outside to help rescue them in case something happens to them, the building comes in on them. So currently when we send one engine in with three people, we have to wait. We have to wait for a second piece of equipment to go inside. Now with four people on the engine, we don't have to wait. So we found a reduction of almost a minute in being able to send those firefighters inside, just on the firefighting side. So we're gonna be uh, evaluating this over the next year. We'll have a six month and a one year evaluation period. And we'll look at the number of units responding, uh, our first unit response time, our ALS paramedic response times, the two in, two out that we just discussed, and then our re responses from automated aid providers. Um, we're set to go March 3rd on these changes. And um, we're gonna, like I said, evaluate at those two benchmarks. And that's my presentation. Questions? Mayor Muffa, a, quick, yes. a quick question, a curiosity question. So when someone calls 911, where does that call go to? I mean, is that? Most of the calls here in the city will go to Westcom first. Westcom. So it goes to the police dis dispatch. They're what's called the PSAP, the primary um, uh, service provider there. And they will transfer the call to us, OCFA. So one of those stations medical. will get it or both of those stations? Or? It depends on where the call is. And um, the idea is that one station will get it. Well, if I live by pavilions, for example, and I call 911, can you walk me through how that process takes place? It would go to Westcom, who would send it over to OCFA, and OCFA dispatches it out to the closest station. So um, say pavilions, then uh, okay. you're right on the border of engine two in Los Alamitos and engine 48, um, and depends if one of them is busy or not. And then you would get the medic van from 48 currently, and regardless of which one that's running with. In the new model, you would get either engine 48 or engine two. And uh, it would just, uh, that would be your response. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, yes. Mayor. Uh, I wondered, it seems, uh, I'm assuming that you get a lot of calls to Leisure World right now. Yes. Uh, how will this have a, any kind of detrimental effect on that, spreading them out, or? No, um, what we have, uh, the, what makes this successful also is our partnership with Care Ambulance. So the way that we're going to be working this is the paramedic engine will have two sets of gear on it. So if somebody needs to be escorted to the hospital with paramedic level care, we can take one of those paramedics, send them to the hospital, and still have engine 48 remain in service with the paramedic on it. So um, currently when medic 48 escorts somebody, all that's left is some EMTs on Ford engine 48. So we still have to pull paramedics from um, usually Westminster or from uh, Cyprus at that point. That was my second question was leaving the van and going to the truck, was that a problem? But apparently, apparently yeah. not. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. The mayor has one. Yes, uh, council member. Um, is changing this uh, gonna affect what the city of Seal Beach pays for the OCFA? Or? No, that's the best part of it, okay. right? So the same number of bodies, and um, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be a no-cost item for the city. Okay, thanks. All right. Could, uh, Madam City Manager, could you um, explain what Westcom is to the people in the audience that might not know that terminology? We'll actually turn it over to our acting police chief, Joe Miller, and have him okay walk you through it. Uh, Madam Mayor and Council, uh, Westcom is the West Communications. It's between, uh, we dispatch for three cities, actually four agencies, Cypress, Los Alamitos, and Seal Beach. And as uh, the fire chief says, uh, the calls will come directly into us. And we will then, uh, we have a system in place where they can radio directly and transfer the call directly into fire. So we take all the calls for service. We dispatch them or we send them directly to fire and then they'll dispatch. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the council? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Before we get started, I'd just like to um, point out that we have a lot of students in the audience again this evening. 
It must not be the end of the semester yet. Uh, they're here to do their government requirement. And, um, and welcome to the meeting. I hope you get a lot out of it. Try and stay till the end. And um, I hope you all get an A on your papers. Oral communications. At this time, members of the public may address the council regarding any items within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city council. Pursuant to the Brown Act, the council cannot discuss or take action on any items not on the agenda unless authorized by law. Matters not on the agenda may, at the city council's discretion, be referred to the city manager and placed on a future agenda. Those members of the public wishing to speak are asked to come forward to the microphone and state their name for the record. All speakers will be limited to a period of five minutes. Any documents for review should be presented to the city clerk for distribution. City clerk is over there. Okay, first speaker. Your name and what city you're coming from. Pia Hirsch and Seal Beach. I was here at the last city council meeting to propose a ban on polystyrene in restaurants. I just wanted to thank Mayor Masalavit for directing the staff to put this issue on a future agenda. And I also wanted to thank Council Member Deaton for her suggestions by email. I also wanted to give you an update on this issue. The Lion Club have contacted me and informed me that they are banning polystyrene in their organization. And it also looks as though Long Beach might be banning polystyrene as well. It looks like this issue has really taken off and I'm so glad that our city is taking a serious look at this problem. Thank you. You're very welcome. Next. Good evening, Tom Stretz. I'm the president of the Seal Beach Police Foundation. We remind everyone, particularly the students, that we are an independent, nonprofit organization that uh, is staffed by a board of directors who um, are men and women in the community, the movers and shakers, and our whole goal is to raise resources that are unbudgeted for the police department and help them along their mission. Um, I, too, want to thank uh, our police department for the wonderful job they continue to do. Day in and day out, uh, we, have, we are blessed with a police department that is so well uh, managed and run. Thank you, guys. And also, um, you know this is coming. We'd like the immediate reinstatement of Chief Joe. Y you've got to be as tired of hearing that as we are tired of saying it. But we're going to continue, make no doubt about it, until Chief Joe is back in his seat doing what he does best. That's leading. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, uh, City Council, City staff, and community members. My name is Tanya Pham. I'm, um, I'm here on behalf of the um, Army, United States Army Association, Greater Los Angeles Chapter. I have a quick presentation. Um, I would like to echo the gentleman uh, just was here that uh, we want to um, acknowledge the police department for their effort to support our uh, veteran on ride, which is a motorcycle rally, just took place on November 6th, uh, and uh, I'm here. I would like to invite the Chief and Sergeant Henderson up here for a moment, if you don't mind. I have a presentation to present. So, this is on behalf of the uh, United States Army Association, Greater Los Angeles Chapter. We live in the land of the free because of the brave like you. So we would like to thank you for your support, uh, exceptional support to our veteran on the ride. Um, because of your support, we were able to raise over 10000 to support the Veteran Service Center at the Los Alamitos days, which many of you are familiar with. Um, so this is all. Thank you to you. Um, 
Dave Peter, could you come up here, please? I know you want to start. So Dave, as you know, he uh, volunteered to help take picture for the ride last year, and uh, and this year he was busy, and but he re uh, recommend other volunteers to us. So on behalf of the chapter, we would like to present you a certificate. Oh, well, too. thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> I'm never on this side of the camera. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Beverly Bonney. My intent in addressing council tonight is to go back to the beginning of the situation regarding the administration, administrative leave of Police Chief Joe Stolinovich. Orange County Register, Wednesday, October 5th, an article was printed regarding Seal Beach Police Chief being placed on administrative leave. The article states, City Manager Ingram did not return calls requesting comments. Also included in the article was this. We were advised about it on Friday, said City Councilman Gary Miller, added, that council members were not given details about the leave or its circumstances. I was surprised, of course. He has been an absolutely outstanding police chief. Sun newspaper, Thursday, October 6th, reports that late on Wednesday afternoon, October 5th, the city of Seal Beach issued a statement that reads, in part, quote, on September 29th, 2016, the city of Seal Beach placed Chief Joe Stalinovich on paid administrative leave pending a confidential personnel investigation. The city is issuing this statement to provide the public with as much information as it can at this juncture and to address some misinformed statements or speculation about this matter. The city's action became necessary because a formal complaint was made against the chief of police alleging serious misconduct. Chief Stalinovich, like any employee accused of misconduct, is presumed to be innocent. In this same article was a statement issued by Councilwoman Deaton saying she was told the upsetting news just before leaving on a cruise. So for purposes of clarification, September 29th, 2016 was a Thursday, the day Chief Stalinovich was placed on administrative leave according to the official statement issued by the city. According to Councilman Gary Miller's statement, he said, we, I'm not sure who we are, but he said, we were advised about it on Friday. That would have been the day after the chief was placed on leave. So when the public and community are told that the city received an official complaint and the city's actions became necessary and the city has a duty under applicable law, who are we talking about? Jill Ingram, the city manager? Because it appears not one council member was even aware of the allegations against the chief or of the actions taken by the city manager Jill Ingram until after the fact. If you go to the Seal Beach City website, you can access labor contracts of city employees. The city manager and chief of police are both at will employees. The city manager is employed at the pleasure of the city council. The city and the chief of police is employed at the pleasure of the city manager. The city attorney is contractually obligated to provide legal assistance and advice relating to routine personnel and employment matters, including the drafting of employment agreements. The course of action and manner in which the city, in other words, city manager Jill Ingram, has dealt with the allegations towards Chief Stalinovich are reprehensible. One minute, it appears it appears to the general public 
that elected Seal Beach City Council members are weak and powerless, maybe even fearful, dare I say, of doing the right thing. We all know the right thing to do. Reinstate Chief Stalinovich. Next person. Okay, seeing no one, then we will move on to this. Joyce, you did it again. Are you coming up? Well, we didn't have meetings for a while, so I'm sorry. I just couldn't get up fast enough, but um, hello and welcome, new city council persons. Glad to have you. And um, there's a lot to be talked about, and I'm sure you know. And I didn't stay at the last council meeting, and Council on Vero Papa, I'm shocked you wouldn't take the time to be mayor. Come on, it's your city. And I, I just would like for a lot of people to know that it's packed on the weekends out at that pier. It's packed. And that pier is down because of the city manager and the Eloy Deaton. And the city council did nothing, nothing to protect that pier for the taxpayers in this city. Could you speak up a little bit into the mic? Okay. Oh, well, I'm Joyce. Old Town, Seal Beach. And um, at the uh, last city council meeting, Council Vera Papa asked the city attorney about the legal expenses that had incurred of $19,000. His answer was Gum Grove Park, Caltrans, and California Public Request Act, Request Act. That's me and a couple other people trying to get the city to be transparent. The city manager, Jill, has never been transparent. It was 2015, January, and it's now 2017, that I came up here and said she should resign because she had three contracts where she took taxpayers' money to float these papers of calling herself Dear Neighbor. She's not our neighbor. This is a charter city, and you are voted in to take care of the city problems. She's not our neighbor. And now look where we are. We have crime in the streets. We have sidewalks on Main Street that are in bad shape. Somebody's going to get hurt bad on one of those over there. We have crime, people running up and down the street, stealing everything they can. People going on bikes with cameras, taking, and don't leave your garage door open because they'll come back. So, and now we have a new problem with pensions. I'm not sure if you've heard, but their uh, city up in Moran County is going to go to the California Supreme Court because of pensions, how they take their vacation time and attach it to their pension plans, how they take bonus money, and I don't know if this is true or not, but the city manager's talking about giving bonuses. Are you aware of this, that we're going to give bonuses and they can attach that to their pension plans? So um, it needs to be recalled. Every time I come up here, it needs to be recalled the problems. And she started the problems. We didn't. We vote you in. We can vote you out. And the other problem, it's just like 
how long did it take me to get the, that alley started over there on 7th Street? Two and a half years. Look where those people are now. They'll be lucky to get the cars in the alley for another month. Another month. One minute, please. One minute. Well, and we still have the broker owner here. And I've heard that we don't have to have anybody sign for him to work part-time on other jobs. But that's not true. The ethics, the, the uh, police ethics code says that he has to have somebody sign. Who's going to sign? City manager? Come on. You can't trust her. We don't need a, a broker owner being a chief, even though he's called an interim chief. And I get confused. Are we talking about chief one or chief two? We don't need chief two to come here and be a broker in our town without someone saying that it's not a conflict of interest. Thank you. Charmin Snow, Old Town, Seal Beach. Um, who here would like to see Chief Joe come back? Hey. Hold up your sign. This is what we want. We want our chief back. We also want you to take a look at the person who calls herself our neighbor because she is our problem. And you've heard it before. That's what we would like those of you who are elected officials for the city of Seal Beach to do. Thank you. Bring back Chief Joe. Good evening, Robert Goldberg. Um, I'd like to talk about fire and police. I appreciate the uh, presentation we had tonight, and I think the plan looks like a good plan. My, my question is whether our old town fire station, Fire Station 44, which currently has uh, three people and will go to four people under this plan, whether it physically uh, can accommodate uh, four people sleeping and living there versus the three. Um, unfortunately, the, uh, the new fire station, Fire Station 48 in Leisure Road, um, which we built in 2008, is quite large. It's got 10 rooms and five people. So now that will have 10 rooms and for four people. But um, um, I'd really like to have an assessment as to what this means for our facility downtown. Um, regarding police, I'd like to speak to item J, which is on the agenda tonight. And this is a proposal for us to uh, create a position of police recruit. Um, traditionally, when we hire police officers in the city, uh, we've taken what's called lateral police officers, which are police officers that are fully trained com coming from other agencies. Um, these police officers that are, have already finished uh, obviously, they're, they're um, um, state-mandated training, and they have experience, et cetera. Um, this is a proposal to take a, uh, someone that has no experience in police um, and train them um, at our cost, and then uh, both at the academy and then afterwards. Um, the financial analysis, um, I think, is, is, a, is a little bit apples and oranges. Um, the way it's presented to you by staff is that um, this proposal would save about $25,000 a year. And what they're comparing is the uh, cost of this recruit, um, which is lower than a police officer. They're comparing that to what it would cost us uh, for a, a lateral full police officer. And the difference, even including the training cost, is about $25,000. Um, so, you know, from a budget point of view, I mean, it's true if, if you – leave a position open, and instead of filling a position for six months, you send someone to the academy um, at the end of the year, we're 25000 to the better. But um, it, it's really an, an apples and oranges compar comparison because we're not getting any police service out of that police recruit. While that person's at the academy, they're not out catching the bad guys. So we really get no, um, no direct return at all from that investment. Um, so I think the proper way to look at it is the $46,000 or so that we would spend for that recruit and their training costs, that is the cost. 
It's not mitigated. It's not offset. Um, and in fact, I think that's an underestimate of what the cost would be. Um, there's a few other factors. Uh, one is that um, there's about a 20% uh, probability that that recruit will fail the academy. And um, I, I'm a retired medical director from the county of Los Angeles, and dealing with police recruits is what I've been doing for the last 29 years of my life when I'm not here. Um, and um, I've looked at data of, that's from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, and th their um, dropout rate for what they call partner agencies, which is what we would probably be um, with Orange County Sheriff's Department, is about 20%. So you don't recover that. Someone goes for two, three months out of a six-month academy, and they drop out. We're just out of that money. So that's an additional cost. And then while this person's trained for six months, unless we're overstaffed in our police department to maintain our patrols, et cetera, at service levels that we all expect, we'll have to pay overtime. Um, that won't be cheap. Um, that will be thousands of dollars, maybe tens of thousands of dollars. I don't know. Um, but that's an additional cost on top of the 46000 that we should um, consider. And then after the person graduates from the academy, um, they do have a what's called a post certificate from the state. Um, they can arrest people. They can carry a gun. But they're green. They have no training. And you cannot put that person in the field by themselves. Typically what happens is you partner that person with uh, a training officer. Um, County of, uh, of Los Angeles typically did that place. for a year. And then during that, during that time, that period of a year, um, you've got two officers in one car. Um, whereas right now our patrols are one person uh, patrols. And so you're still, for that training year, um, you're down an officer to respond to a second call if there's one. The only reason to do it this way is if we cannot get a lateral to fill our positions. And I've been told that um, we've not had any trouble recruiting laterals in the last year or two. So um, I think you really should look long and hard at this uh, proposal um, and question staff as to whether this is really necessary. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Janine Edwards. I'm an uh, Old Town resident. Please excuse my dress as I learned of the meeting a little late in the evening, but I felt pressed to come here and um, make a request to you guys. I live on 8th Street in PCH, right where um, all the construction is happening in the alley, which we're very thankful for. Um, but at the same time, I would like to request that there is some kind of update as to what's going on, as it has taken longer than we expected and, and you guys estimated. Um, it, it is causing a lot of issue with our parking and things of that nature. Um, so there's my first request. Second, we're having a lot of issues with the parking citations. Um, we were given flimsy pieces of paper to put in our car windows to prove our residency and our right to park on the street where we pay taxes. Um, and we're happy to do so because, again, we're thankful for that, the construction. However, we're getting citations when we do have our permit in our car. And when we come to speak at the city or the police station, we're told, prove your permit was in the car. How can you prove it, you ask? I'm kind of asking you, how can we prove it? How can we prove that our permits are in our car? What can we do to fight that citation? It's been with close neighbors of mine, quite a few of us have experienced this same exact thing a couple times over. One person went to speak to an officer after getting a citation and their permit was taped in the windshield um, and she was told well sometimes the parking meter people don't get out of the car before they write the geez that just cost me 50 bucks so if we could just get some kind of clarification and maybe an update of what's happening and maybe some I don't know communication to the officers that are working hard keeping this you know people not taking advantage of the parking I do appreciate that too as a as a citizen of, of Seal Beach but if we could just kind of get something moving there so that we're not being taken advantage of as the taxpayers thank you thank you Can we have a little update? <laughs> could you give your contact information to Robin please oh Okay, Henderson's taking care of it. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Good evening, Council. Happy New Year, everybody. 
Um, what I'd like to address, uh, we hear for a uh, couple of months now all these things about a city manager and, um, you know, they're cruising and lunches and everything else. And what I was wondering, because um, I've had people on the street actually stop and start volunteering information, and one of the things people ask is, how did she get that job? And um, I probably would like to ask uh, Councilwoman Deaton that. She's the only council member up here that was um, still a council member when Ms. Ingram was hired. Um, so I've made a couple of phone calls. I know a few people around. And um, one of the things someone had mentioned to me, didn't anyone check into her background how she ran offices on her last jobs? Because she has um, no, had no experience as a city manager. So going back to Downey Unified School District, when she was a, uh, a secretary for one of the supervisors, I guess it was, um, what I was told by people in that office, well, heck, she ran the exact, that office the exact same way that was run here. Um, with fear and intimidation. And if somebody uh, shined or if somebody got, well, you can roll your eyes if you want, Madam Mayor, but I that's what I was told, eyes. you know. I closed so, my So, um, yeah, well, whatever, you know, because quite frankly, the community is tired of it. Yeah. Yeah, they really are, you know, and they've lost all confidence, the city manager and new mayor and you, Ms. Deaton, and they will, uh, <laughs> and they will govern our, our community in a fair manner that gives everybody a break a fair break. And not only that, they just lost respect for you. So, you know, I asked this. Um, you really obviously didn't check in the uh, city manager's background before you hired her. So, why don't you all do us a favor and uh, do what the community wants and uh, set an example for our city manager and just step back and recuse yourself for the rest of your term. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Oh, Bruce? Yes, ma'am. Uh, council members and the audience, I'd like to um, suggest to the audience, I know they're here for a lot of times a single purpose, but tonight we have not only the championship football game that I'm missing, <laughs> but we have basically what is a one-time event for all the citizens, and that's a review of the CAFRA. Now, the CAFRA is the financial statement. We start with the budget, which is kind of a projection, and it covers a period of time of a year, and then the CAFRA covers what actually occurred during the year. And Vicki has been really good describing it and explaining it, and I would encourage you to, uh, to stay and listen to that. And I think it's very important because it gives you a lot of insight in advance of what has not only happened, but what is coming. And uh, the auditor, which enclosed the note, part of the agenda item, indicated one of the most sensitive items to the city that can affect it is the estimate of net pension liability as well as the other post-employee benefit uh, benefits or liability, you might say, because we owe them the money. That's going to be covered, is covered in the CAFRA, and I suggest people take a minute and read it. On 1220, the three six-hour session, total of six-hour session, of the Board of Trustees of CalPERS met. And the data that we have here in the CAFRA was what was available for the prior years. But this is addressing what's happening now and what they're changing. And they kind of slipped it out. Well, I don't know, they slipped it out. They probably had their meeting and it was all scheduled. But it did happen to come out just before the holidays. And um, a couple of members of the council emailed me with the news release. I had the news release. But listening to the six-hour presentation was enlightening. What one of the trustee members brought out is that CalPERS now is suffering a $5 billion net cash outflow every year. And it's expected to go up about a billion dollars a year. Now, we've made adjustments in the past, going back to the safety plan in 2008 by borrowing money to try to fund it. We have unfunded liability that have been identified in our CAFRA. 
And now this change, for those of you who might misinterpret what they said, they were lowering the estimated rate of return down, staged in to about 7%. I calculated the difference between the 7.5 and, and, and 7, and it represents about a $21 million shortfall. And it wouldn't, if we were to pay it off all in one lump sum, it would be less if it was paid off on day one, day one being July 1st of 2017. But the present value of that $21 million would be the amount we would need, and hesitating to try to calculate that because it's affected by this meeting that we, I listened to and heard and the data. And the data that they're bringing out spells the same problem that most of the pension plans have, is we have baby boomers retiring. We had experience 20 years ago and 30 years ago when these things were set up, a period where we were growing and we had more members coming and paying and we had a surplus and it provided CalPERS with the opportunity to be opportunistic to choose when they made investments and how they did that. One minute, please. Unfortunately, the reverse is true and they discussed that. And they also had some political issues with tobacco stocks and 13 investments they had to take out. And they're expecting that this number may actually be high. And what that means to you in the city is it means more dollars out of our pocket to protect the people who worked with the agreement that they're going to get their retirement benefit. And we don't have a choice with that end unless they were to say we want less benefit. But that isn't going to happen. I doubt. And um, they've made concessions already. But I think what I'm asking you to do as a council is to bring these forward. And we always have wants and needs. Everybody wants something, but there are needs that you have to supply. And one of our needs is if we put a little money, uh, pay it a little early, it'll multiply the amount of savings over a period of time. It's an issue that will continue to come up, and I thank you for hearing me out. I know it's, uh, it's not one of those issues anybody really loves. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Clasannon, old man in old town. Happy New Year to you guys. Congratulations to both of you. I hope you enjoy it. Good, good luck with it. Um, usually when I get up here, I'm in a hurry, and I don't even get close to my five minutes. But I want, I want to think about some things and talk a little more about it. Uh, first of all, Mayor, I understand you folks had a closed session this evening. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, I would like to ask in that closed session, was there any discussion about our chief situation that you can talk about no. or not? No on both counts? No, we have the, the agenda. It's right here. Oh, I'm sorry. Of what we discussed in close session. Yeah. Okay. So I'm here to support Chief Joe. I kind of stay in touch with him by texting. I know he's going through a pretty tough time, and I'm supporting him as much as I can. The other thing I want to talk about is that we do have an incredible community. And there's a lot of wonderful people in here. And in my business in real estate, working with property 30 years now, I get a lot of calls during the course of the year from clients who are trying to improve their property in some way. And they're calling me up and saying, hey, what the heck's going on? I went up to City Hall. They told me I can't do that. I've even had people say, they kind of laughed at me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you want to do that? And I don't know, I haven't spent a lot of time in City Hall lately, but I did many years ago a lot. And what I remember is walking in and saying, hey, how you doing? Jim, how you doing? What can we do for you? You know, what, what is it we can help you with? That type of thing. Well, I'm presently under, undergoing rebuilding my, de my deck at my house right over here in the corner of 7th and Central. And... Um, Oh, I need to back up. I sold the house on 6th Street to a, uh, a realtor flipper, 
And I'm really sorry now that I took her text off of my phone, which I had on, that she sent me a few months ago when she was about in the middle. And, and I'm not going to throw any names out, but she said, you know, uh, Jim, this inspector came by. I, it was terrible. He put down my Mexican help, tried to make us think we were worthless, and we couldn't do a damn thing right on that property, and it's just going on and on and on. Well, I haven't had that lately. I haven't had that before, but I have had it a little bit this week. My property is being done by a very reputable company who's engineered the project, who I've even taken the former um, uh, person that worked here over to look at the deck and prior to finishing it off. He said, oh, I haven't seen one done this well in a long time. So I had the inspector over on Tuesday morning. I had to leave, but he totally came in and ripped them left and right. Came back on Tuesday, demanded that they had to open up because he wanted to check something out, which brings up the question of me. When somebody pulls a permit to do something, do they get a letter with it or get told that, we want to inspect the page and before you close it up because my guy did not have that and he did a great job. And I had to leave again. So I had him call me later and they said, yeah, he made us tear part of it up so he could see it was okay and he's going to prove it. I said, when? He said, tomorrow. He's coming back on Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. I said, he was here Thursday, he watched you rip it up and he didn't sign off. What the hell did he think? You weren't going to put it back together? So my feeling about that is when somebody comes out to represent the city, they're also representing the people of this community. And rather than get all over their ass and chew them out, I would like to see them something like this. Oh, how are you doing today? Good. So where are you guys? Well, what have you done so far? Yeah, that looks pretty good. Can you tell me a little more about this and that? Don't work with them and cooperate with them. And my, my builder says to me, Jim, go on, go do what you need to do. My engineer's on the way here to prove this guy wrong or that we're doing it right. So I, I don't know. I, I know one thing. If the guy was in real estate, he wouldn't sell one damn house. Anyone else? Okay, going. Uh, city Attorney's Report. Mayor, Mayor um, Council, prior to the meeting this evening, the Council met in closed session uh, regarding the conference with labor negotiator that appeared on the posted agenda. The Council took a report from staff, held a discussion about those two listed uh, employee groups, and took no reportable action. Thank you. Are you completed? Yes. Okay. Thank you. City Manager? Yes, Mayor. Thank you. I have one item tonight. I know there's been some questions and concerns from the public um, regarding beach cleaning. So I'd like Joe Bailey um, just to give an update um, on our process and the collaboration between the Marine Safety Department and Public Works. Joe? Thank you, Madam City Manager, uh, City Council. Um, real quick, I wanted to um, explain where this refuse that we've seen on the beach over the last few weeks has come from. So um, the, most of this, if not all of it, comes down the San Gabriel River through our storm, uh, stormwater runoff system throughout all of LA County and Orange County and through the San Gabriel River Basin. So anything that's on the streets goes into the gutters, into the storm basins, ends up in the San Gabriel River, and eventually ends up down on our beach. So uh, a few weeks ago, we had which will lift a bunch of debris off the rocks that's already in the river. And then we had a rain event. And this rain event then flushed the river out. Um, the Surfrider Foundation has, um, has a stat out there that says that 80% uh, of the pollution on the streets and then the storm drains will come down the river after one inch of rain. And then this is after a dry period. So we had a long dry period. 
And then their, their stats say 80% of the pollution will come out of the river after one inch of rain. So we had that event happen. Um, so we ended up with, with quite a bit of refuse on the beach. Um, and that refuse, refuse included um, hypodermic needles, pill bottles, and, and all kinds of other stuff. So um, as a lifeguard department, you know, we are worried about beach hazards, are definitely a beach hazard. We don't want anyone getting stuck with those. So as a lifeguard department, we let Public Works know who they clean the beach, and then we look for any hypodermic needles we can find. So I had lifeguards for two lifeguards for over an hour looking through the debris fill, and we ended up with over, um, it was 25 to 30 syringes. We don't actually count them. We pick them up and put them in our sharps container. And, and then uh, Public Works did a uh, extra beach cleanup. So I, I know we've had some concerns about those, and, and it's, a, it's a difficult item to get off the beach sometime, but um, we do the best we can. They see a syringe on the beach to go ahead and just mark it with a stick, stand a stick straight up, let the lifeguard know, and we'll come down and take care of it. We have personal protective equipment and special containers for syringes, and we definitely don't want to get anybody stuck trying to clean up the beach. Now, with that being said, like I said, we notify Public Works, and they have uh, the big equipment to clean up more of the mess. We're, we're definitely just looking for the syringes as lifeguards and uh, trying to remove that hazard. And, and just to point out before I pass it on to the Director of Public Works, Jim Basham, that uh, the Public Works guys, the beach crew guys, do a great job of keeping our beach clean, and um, and they they just do a fantastic job for us. So, um, <coughs> Director Basham. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, just to give you an idea, I mean, at this time of year, beach cleaning is done five days a week. Typically, it's Monday through Friday. When we do have the rainy season, or if it's high tide, then I do have guys that work Saturday and Sundays. Um, we did contact other agencies or other cities. We did contact Huntington Beach and Newport Beach to get an idea as to whether or not they follow the same procedure. And we also ask if they receive a high content of the same type of uh, debris and matter that we're experiencing. And uh, it was consistent, meaning, yes, they receive just as much as what we receive. They're, um, they have the same type of equipment that we do that is similar with a raking system where it doesn't uh, bury any of the debris. Instead, what it does, it rakes it up. So it forks up whatever is in the sand, and then we collect it. And then if it's hypodermic needles or any other biohazard material that gets put in, a, in the red typical biohazard containers, we usually typically give that to either the lifeguards or to the, um, to the Orange County Fire Authority for disposal purposes. So again, during this time of year, we have uh, two rakes that we use, and we are very cognizant of the fact that after it rains, it takes a day or two before what is flowing down the, um, the river reaches our sand area, so then we will rake um, additional times. So even though it's five times typically during this time of year, after the rainy or high tide, the staff is out there working even more times in regards to raking. Um, question? Councilmember Beaton. Um, Chief Bailey, could you give the phone number out, please? Because I think that a lot of people have their cell phones on them uh, when they're out there, and if they have the phone number to call to get a lifeguard to go out there, I think that would be helpful. Uh, absolutely, Councilwoman. Um, the business number for the lifeguard department, Marine Safety Department, is 562 430 2613. And anytime we're, uh, we're open, we have a lifeguard answering that phone. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I have tonight. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to council items. Um, can we have a motion approving the consent calendar except for item G and J? Mayor, if, if we could just back up for a minute and do council comments, and then we have two oh. items, A and B, under council that will be sorry, considered I separately. I'm sorry, I about those. I just jumped right ahead. Okay, council comments. Let's start with Council Member Deaton. Okay, good evening. Uh, the first thing I would like to do is to request from our attorney a report on the uh, uh, Chief Joe administrative leave, please, if you could please tell us um, information. I know that none of us have forgotten about it, and perhaps uh, you can give us just an update with what you can tell us. 
Um, Mayor, members of the council, um, as I reported at the last council meeting, um, a, an independent uh, third party investigator had been retained to uh, investigate a complaint that was filed. That investigation um, continues to move quickly toward a completion. Um, we were in contact with um, outside legal counsel today, um, and most recently today. Um, and uh, at such point as there is um, something that we can legally announce, um, we would do that. Um, I don't know. I don't know whether there will be um, the ability to do that, depending on the conclusion of the investigation. Um, there was a question raised by a speaker this evening about um, consulting with the city council prior to um, the time uh, that the chief was placed on administrative leave. And I know the council is aware, um, but would just um, reiterate what has been said previously, which is that the city charter, uh, specifically sections 406 and 604, among others, specifically um, states that the city manager is in charge of the administrative service of the city, as well as um, uh, employee um, discipline and, and um, investigations, and that the city council is specifically prohibited by the city charter from interfering um, in those uh, matters, and that is why um, the matter has progressed as it has. But we recognize, as, as, all, as we've said consistently, that there is a uh, sensitivity on the part of the community to have this wrapped up as uh, quickly as possible. We also know the community wants it completed fairly and um, completely, and we are moving toward doing that. And um, obviously the employee involved wants those things as well as the person who filed the complaint. And we are um, working in a way that protects everybody's rights. All right, thank you. I wanna make it very clear that I am not fearful. I also uh, want to be very clear that uh, this is not in my jurisdiction. I understand that some of you feel that if uh, we fired certain personnel in the city that then everything would be fine. Um, we could, every one of us be gone, every member of the staff could be gone, and it's still not in our jurisdiction. It has to go through the process. So when we are finished with the process at that time, then there may be other things that'll happen. But right now, it's not in our jurisdiction. There's nothing that we can do about it by law. And that's the municipal code. Someone said, well, why don't you change the municipal code? We could do that. We could change the municipal code and it still won't affect this case because that would be going backwards. And you can't go backwards to change law once you're in it. So. None of us asked for this, none of us want this, but this is where we find ourselves and we will continue to uh, plug forward uh, the best we can do. We, we do understand the community is upset. I want you to know that we are upset too. I am upset too. So we're all in this together. We are trying to get through it together. Um, I would like to revisit the um, the, the problems that we're having on the beach uh, right now with the storms. I would like to ask a couple of things. Um, Sean Crumby, when he was here as Public Works Director and I discussed that we used to, in conjunction with Long Beach, have a boom in the river, which would help keep from having debris come down the river. Uh, there were some issues with it. It was, I don't know, at least 10 or 15 years ago now. And I'm sure that technology has improved and I would like to request um, an agenda item and it doesn't have to be in the next two meetings, which I think is what our normal one is, but uh, to look at uh, grant opportunities, maybe partnering with the other cities. I would think that it would be a really good idea to go up the 52 cities along the river and see if we can't get uh, buy-in from the cities that are actually sending us uh, the things down the river and get our river protected to catch the things. I understand one of the problems we did have was um, flooding. Hopefully the technology has 
improved and there are other ways of dealing with it but it seems to me that we need to keep it from coming to our beach we aren't the ones doing that, and that means we've got a lot of people that are responsible for it so there are a lot of agencies from save our beach to surf rider to our lifeguards to our residents and we are all trying to keep on top of this but frankly the 52 cities above us contribute more than we can all keep clean together so perhaps a boom is it's time for a boom again as a shared resource so I would uh, request that in the future this be an agenda item uh, for us um, also um, I would like to talk about our procedures for flood watch I've had a few calls and emails of people saying I don't see the pumps why would they be at the yard um, I just was wondering if uh, perhaps you could um, city manager ask one of your um, staff to tell us what is the flood watch procedure that's in place let's say it's Friday night at midnight and we're getting a lot of rain um, how would they know what pumps to put out and who would know sure we're happy to so I'll ask our community development director Jim Basham to provide an update thank you um, that's a good that's a good question and just as an example over the weekend because we did have heavy rain especially I think it was on Sunday night last night I did have staff that actually came in so it's almost like an, a, 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 um, a cognizant alarm that goes off with the supervisor and some of the employees where they automatically know that when it's raining hard then it just triggers them that they need to come in and take a look at everything so when we do have rain that is constant over a period of time I have staff that will come out, they will assess the different uh, areas of the city and determine whether or not there's a need to bring in or mobilize additional staff to bring out pumps and so far that has not been the requirement. Okay, and do our police check when they're out um, patrolling? I probably want to defer if, if that. If they had trouble going through the water, they might call somebody. <laughs> Once we sink, we call them. But, um. <laughs> We've had that happen. Um, yes, we uh, we monitor, and then in the event, we contact uh, Jim actually directly, and then we'll get somebody out there. Okay, thank you. So I guess the bottom line question is we are being proactive and not reactive. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, my last uh, item is uh, that I would like an agenda item, and I would like to see this within the next two meetings uh, on getting a PRA facilitator, uh, facilitator. Uh, it seems that we are spending a lot of, um, of time and resources and going uh, between the city clerk's office, the attorney's office, and back again. And it, it seems that it's not, it, it is the climate nationally and locally that we are in. And so I think it's time for us to be proactive about the PRA requests as well and I would like to see an analysis I know I talked to um, Robin about it um, a few weeks ago and she said that there were some really good suggestions coming out from her professional organization and I, I think it would be great for us to take a look at that and just think about a new way of dealing with it to make it easier for the public and make it easier for the city as well and that's all I have for tonight thank you oh happy new year could you identify what PRA means for the people who don't know what that is? Yes, Public Records Act requests. In other words, any city documents that uh, we might have that uh, the city would like to see. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Moore. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I'm very pleased. Uh, we had a meeting in College Park West last Saturday with the police. Uh, David Barr and Brian Gray were there and they did a great job along with Wink Chase and I, I want to thank you for, for arranging that and uh, we're very excited in College Park West to get this neighbor for neighbor program going which will help prevent crime and also we're dealing with homelessness uh, issue I'm going to do a ride along with Brian Gray who's the homeless liaison and I'm real excited about what he's doing to break up the encampments and help out the homeless that want to be helped. Um, also, I'm happy to hear about the Bay Theater and the, and the sun and the closing escrow. And I think that would be a great positive improvement for Seal Beach. Um, and I'd also like, want to acknowledge Robert Aguilar here. He's my choice for the planning commissioner. And 
Uh, Robert's been a leader in the Lions Club and as always has his heart and soul in, this, in Seal Beach and he'll be a great uh, choice for a planning commission. That's it. Thank you. Council Member Sestarsik. Good evening. I would like to wish everybody a happy new year. Uh, speaking of that, I think it might have been New Year's Eve. We had a, uh, a house fire up in College Park East, and I would like to thank OCFA. Is he still here? Oh, there we go. Thank you for responding. We got, there was quite a response. Luckily, there wasn't, uh, wasn't a great deal of damage. So anyway, thank you for responding. Um, I would like to thank Mayor Masalavit for putting the uh, plastics ban on a future agenda. I, I am interested in that, and I look forward to hearing more about that. Thank you. And uh, I was also at the Bay Theater. It was very interesting to be able to go over, take a look, and, and uh, look at all the, all the space in there and consider all the possibilities. And thank you, and good luck to those uh, that are going to work on it, too redevelop it. Thank you. Council member. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Happy New Year and ha healthy New Year to all. Um, I just wanted to piggyback on the uh, hypodermic needle issue and the agenda item that Councilman Deaton um, is proposing and ask the mayor um, if she could maybe bring this up at the concerned uh, coastal community coalition meeting that you meet with other beach cities from here, I think, to Del Mar. Um, is it quarterly or monthly? Um, I believe there's one Thursday. Um, I, I'm reading the paper. Newport Beach has the same issues. I'm sure a lot of other beaches have this issue, and maybe we can um, get together and have a coalition with those cities and get some ideas and some procedures. That's a great idea. Yeah, so thank you if you could bring that, and thank you all. Okay. I'm uh, uh, on the agenda tonight to establish it's on the uh, list of groups of committees. Um, we're going to be starting a uh, quarterly meeting between Leisure World and the city. Leisure World has been in its place for well over 55 years. And the city and Leisure World have had little uh, interaction over this time. Um, we're beginning to expand on that and um, take advantage of some of the services that the city provides that can go into Leisure World, like police services, mainly. Um, I'm looking forward to the beginning of that group and how it's uh, going to turn out, what our work program might be, what things the city is interested in accomplishing, and what Leisure World might be interested in accomplishing. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty um, excited about that. I think that'll go pretty well. And can we have a consensus on looking into the boom in the river and putting it on a future agenda? Sure. Is there a consensus? Can, yeah. can we do that then? I don't think we need one, but it's fine to ask for one. Sure. I can't imagine there wouldn't be a consensus, but yeah, yeah let's, we're doing it. Okay. Um, now we can move on to council items, and it's the 2017 City Council appointments as representatives to intergovernmental agencies. And City Manager, can we have a report, please? Yes, I'll uh, turn this item over to our City Clerk, Robin Roberts. And again, this is the um, annual Mayor appointments um, to representatives and alternates to intergovernmental, uh, intergovernmental agencies, which are um, outside governmental groups. So Robin, with that, if you have any other comments. I just have a, a few quick comments, City Manager Ingram, uh, Mayor and City Council members. Before you, we have um, a routine staff report where every year, the first few days in January, the mayor makes appointments to outside intergovernmental agencies. As Mayor Mosulavit mentioned um, just previously, there was an item that was City Council on December 12, 2016, approved unanimously to have the coalition to participate. If the coalition forms and there's any changes to the membership or participation, that item will come back to Council and be reconsidered if necessary. The resolution.
Resolution um, 6074 does have one correction to it on page two. The term of the Orange County Vector Control will be through 2020. With that, if you have any questions, otherwise it concludes my report. Thank you. Are there any questions from the council? Anyone who doesn't like where they've been placed? It'll be an adventure. <laughs> okay, um, do we need to vote on this? Yes. City Manager, yes? Okay, is there a motion to adopt uh, the 2017 City Council appointments? So moved. Second? Is there a second? Second. Okay, so star six second. All those in favor, vote. Or <laughs> anybody vote. <laughs> Okay, five to nothing, I think. Um, item B is the 2017 Boards, Commissions, and Committees Annual Appointments. And this is for appointments to the city's boards, commissions, and committees. Uh, can we have a staff report, please? to approve the appointments that have been um, appointed by each district in the city of Seal Beach. Appointments to boards, commissions, and committees for the city are generally placed by district. Um, I wanted to let you know that this year the city clerk's <coughs> office has done some outreach to the community and we will continue to grow our outreach to the community so they know about what's called the MADIAC or local appointment <coughs> listing. We did put information in the um, Parks and Recreation um, Winter mag Magazine as well as did a press release and um, we made the announcement at this December 12th meeting. So the City Clerk's Office will continue to make sure the citizenry is aware of what they can do to apply to uh, participate on um, boards, commissions, and committees. The one item that I would like to bring is I understand there was questions regarding why the Action General Plan slash Local Plan Citizens Advisory Committee was not on this. Um, I'll read you a short um, summary of that committee and how it was formed. Um, in December 20, it was formed by Council Action on um, Resolution 5852, and it was extended on 228.11 through December 12th. By action of the Council on 114.13, it was extended through December 14th. And then by action of the City Council on 1-12-15, it was extended through December 15th. In January of 2016, I did speak with staff, and I understand that at the point where the local Coastal Plan Citizen Advisory Committee needs to be reformed, um, that Director Basham will work with the City Attorney's Office to make sure that that item is formed in compliance with law. Thank you. Are there any questions? I have I have a, a statement, please. I um, I had a resignation from the Parks and Recreation Commission, and I want to thank Roz Bennett for her service, and um, Bruce Bennett for all of his help with her um, at, on the uh, commission. And we are um, having uh, Steve Miller, uh, who's going to be coming on. But I would request that we have a nice. Um, uh, meeting for the commissioners that are going out, please, in recognition of the time that they have spent because there are uh, a lot of commissioners that are in the process of leaving that have given a lot to the, the town. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Please vote. Five to zero. Now, can I have a motion to adopt the consent calendar items except for item G and item J? So moved. Second. Okay, please vote. Five to zero. Um, now, can, uh, uh, we're going to go to item G now. Is the City of Seal Beach annual reports for fiscal year ended June 30, 2016. 
Can we have a staff report, please? Yes, Mayor. Thank you. I'll turn this item over to our finance director. Vicki. As Mr. <coughs> so eloquently spoke earlier about the CAFR, he's right. It is a great source of information regarding the city. Not only is it financial information, but it's specific to many areas of the city in what's called the notes section, and there's another section that's called the management discussion and analysis, full of tons of information. Those of you who like reading those documents can find a lot of information in the CAFR. Tonight, we have uh, Deborah Harper, who's a partner with the city's external audit firm, Lance Salt and Lungard, here to um, do a brief presentation about the comprehensive annual financial report uh, for the year ended June 2016, and then answer any questions that the council might have as a result of her presentation. So, Deborah, come on. Good evening. Thank you for having me here today. Um, as Vicki stated, I wanted to give you just a brief um, conclusion of the audit that we provided to you. Um, in response to that, there's three letters when we always give you the results of the audit. That's important to always review and um, discuss during the results of the audit. The first one is going to be the audit communication letter which was also mentioned today in open discussion, that letter talks about general information, things outside the government auditing standards that were required to report, but just gives you an idea of things to look for when you're reviewing the financial statements. And those items would talk about significant estimates, one being was the pension liability. Obviously, there's a lot of estimates that go into that liability, and it's, it, and it's good to understand that those can fluctuate. Another estimate is going to be the OPEB liability, which also can fluctuate based on the assumptions used to um, calculate the liability. In addition to that letter, we'll discuss if we have any issues, um, like if disagreements with the audit, it would be disclosed in there, which we did not have any disagreements. If there was outside external experts that were brought in um, further for the CAPR, which we had none of those as well. The last item in that letter is also very important. It talks about current pronouncements that changed your financial statements. Last year we talked a lot about the pension liability because that did change the whole look of the financial statements, actually putting that liability on your books and understanding what that means. Um, this year um, we also talked about um, things that are coming in the future, so future um, pronouncements that are going to be coming and affecting your financial statement. So now that we're kind of comfortable with the pension liability, hopefully we'll be more comfortable with the OPEB liability because that will be following suit over the next two years and that liability will be presented in your financial statements. That was the first letter. That's called the audit communication as a result of the audit. The other letter is called the report on internal controls. Now this letter will discuss the different types of, um, or our responsibility over the inter internal controls. It's important to understand when we come out as your external auditors to be, to do the financial audit, that's exactly what we're doing. We're looking at the financial statements in whole as far as the financial reporting. Our goal is not to evaluate your internal controls and to give you an opinion on that. That's outside the financial audit. But what we do do is while we're doing the internal controls is we have to evaluate them. We need to understand the processes within the city to make sure that we can actually rely on the financial numbers coming out of the system, which is within the city. As we do those items, at any time if we come across something that we feel that was a significant weakness or material weakness, we are required to report that in this letter. There was one item that we did note in this letter. Um, that happened to fall under the material weakness, and the difference between the significant deficiency and the material weakness has a lot to do with the dollar amount. So if, a, if we make an adjustment to the financial statements that has a significant dollar amount, which in this case it was, it would um, result in a material weakness. At this time, I don't feel like it's a systemic item that, you, that um, is, I feel is going to keep continuing. It was a one-time item. It was related to grant reporting. Now, in the grant reporting, it's very important to understand that grants are uh, decentralized at the city, which is extremely common. So if you have a police grant, obviously the police department will be very involved. If you have a public works, you're going to go with public works. So each department is monitoring a lot of the grants. 
all of this transaction, these transactions as far as the expenditures and reimbursement need to be funneled through the financial, through the finance department. So this requires a lot of coordination within the departments and timing. When we did the financial audit, we noticed that we did receive some revenues that came in for a prior year expenditure. When that happens, the revenue should have been um, tied to the prior year financial statement. So we need to make an adjustment for financial reporting purposes. As a result of that adjustment, because of the dollar amount, it is disclosed in this letter. So that was um, the item that is in the report on internal control. Before I move to the last question, is there any questions on that that you want to discuss? Do you have anything um, on the report on internal control? Uh, well, can you explain the uh, uh, the grant, what the amount was and what that was? Yes. So the amount um, was $374,000. It was just over that amount, and it was in the Public Works Department. And so these expenditures were actually incurred in the, as I said, in the previous year. And when that happens, you want the revenue to be recognized at that same time. So you would want a receivable on the book stating you already spent this money, but the grant should be coming in to be paying for it. And it came in in the new year, and it should have been recorded in the prior year. So that's why we made the adjustment. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. And then the last letter is the important one. It's your opinion letter. So um, we provided an opinion of an unmodified opinion, which is the highest level of opinion that you could receive. The different levels, you could get a modified opinion. There are different levels of the opinion. The unmodified meaning we did not modify or qualify our opinion in any way. At some point, you can say the financial statements are great, except for capital assets would be an example. That would be considered a modification. So when we issue you an unmodified opinion, I want you to know that it means there's no modifications to your letter, and we feel very comfortable that you can make good financial decisions on the, on the CAFR. Did you have a question? No, I just wanted to say thank you for making sure that every little detail is in there. I love it when you find something because then we know you really, really looked. So thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. And we did meet, just so you know, um, I, it is very important to know that the City of Seal Beach has an audit committee. I work with many, 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 many cities, and not everybody does. There's a very fine few amount of cities that do have an audit committee. So being that you had an audit committee, we did already meet on December 15th, which allows you to have face-to-face -face contact. Um, and um, Mayor Masalavit and Mayor Pratem Verapapa were both there during the audit committee where we can discuss the CAFR in more detail. You can look at more pages. Um, I can bore you to death with my excitement about the CAFR, but um, it gives them an opportunity to ask a lot of questions in detail. So I commend you guys for having the audit committee. It's very appreciated. Any other questions? Um, no, I think that's good. Okay, we need a motion to adopt the CAFR. Do you have a motion? Would you like to make a motion? A right, motion to adopt the CAFR. <laughs> okay, Second. Second. Just for clarification, it's actually a receive and file item, so it's just a motion to receive and file. Okay, motion to receive and file. We don't need to take a vote. Okay. And then we move on to item J, adoption of resolution establishing classification of police recruit. Can we have a staff report, please? Yes, Mayor, thank you. At this time, I'll call forward um, Phil Gonchak, um, police commander, and he will summarize the item and address any questions the council might have. Phil? Thank you, City Manager Ingram. And Madam Mayor, City Council, Happy New Year. As you all said to us earlier tonight, we wish you all the best as well. I am so glad, first of all, that Los Alamos High School students stayed for this, <laughs> this item. Uh, because believe it or not, someday this may apply to you all as well. Uh, go Beach, just in case any of you wonder uh, which school to pick in your future. But more importantly, uh, Mayor, City Council, and members of the public, I come to you to speak about the police recruit position. As most of you know, we've, we've discussed a few things in this last, uh, this last year, particularly, re particularly related to our strategic planning objectives, as well as our succession planning program and things of that nature. 
I want to thank you for this opportunity because it does mean a lot to our organization to not necessarily think outside the box, but give us the opportunity to actually look at our toolbox a little bit deeper. And with that, I want you to look at this item in and of itself as another tool in our toolbox. Because when we keep going deeper outside of the box, things get a little bit hairy. And this is one of those situations where we just needed to narrow our focus and come up with a different plan. And this different plan, I want to give you an example of um, a police recruit that we had back in 1987 that just retired in December of 2016. We're talking almost 30 years of service. His name is Commander Bob Mullins. And he was one of our uh, commanders over the Operations Bureau as well as Support Services Division. Additionally, another police recruit is sitting before me here today, Joe Miller, as well as Officer Eric Tittle, three of probably one of the finest police officers in our organization that we've ever had in history, which also accumulates to about 85 years of extended service. With that, I want to take you through another path of some of our employees that we currently have. Some of the employees that we currently have are, are working full-time jobs, taking care of families who are married with children, and unfortunately aren't afforded that time to take off to go to a police academy for six to seven months without pay. And if you follow in our succession plan, this gives those, those employees that we currently have the opportunity to physically resign from their current position, yet stay paid throughout going through a police academy for about six months. And during this time, we'll do about every week as best as we can to do our checkups with them. But during our checkups, we rely mainly on academy staff. Now, there's a question by Dr. Goldberg here with actually a, a list of questions that I'll go over. But one of those questions was, how much time is our staff going to spend on following this recruit? And it's rather minimal. The reality is, is that we rely solely on Golden West College. Golden West College has reserved a spot for us in April 2017 for their police academy. And is it, our, it is our intention to use them as well. Dr. Goldberg raised an issue about the LA sheriffs and 20% of their recruit population from um, corresponding agencies dropping out. The Golden West College is not the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Neither is the Seal Beach Police Department. However, if you were to look at our past history over the last several years, we've had laterals that have not made uh, full training in our organization. We've had laterals that have also lateraled out to other agencies also had laterals that lateral back to their other agencies. So this gives us that opportunity to groom our own employees and if they so desire to someday become a police officer. And as I stand here before today, I can tell you that there are a handful of, or a handful of employees within our city that are ready for this opportunity. Uh, as far as the, uh, the city's uh, miscellaneous or safety pension plan, I can tell you that the police recruit position will be placed into the miscellaneous pension plan and then once hired onto as a full-time police officer will be moved over to safety. As far as the savings, when we discuss savings inside of that staff report, what we were looking at is finances only. And if you were to look at finances only, just as Dr. Goldberg admitted, $25,136 over a 24-week period of this training academy is true. What's also true is that when we hire a lateral, what we try to do is bring them in at a similar step to what they're being paid at another agency. It helps attract other officers. For example, if we were to hire an Orange County Sheriff's Deputy and they were making $5,000 a month, we're going to do our best to bring them in at a step that's just as close, if not above, what they're currently making at their prior agency. So that's when we talk about savings. That's where our savings comes from. A lateral police officer is more expensive. As far as, uh, as far as the time that is needed for us to hire an academy or hire a police recruit to put into the academy, we look at, yes, it does take six months to complete a police academy. But I put a little timeline here on what our current recruitment plan is for academy graduates as well as laterals. And I'll go through each one of them. It's four to six weeks for us to physically come up with the idea of putting out a police recruitment and a job posting to get applicants interested in the Seal Beach Police Department. Additionally, it takes one week for us as a police department to put together a written physical examination preparation. That's going through with our liability waivers as well as using the facilities at Golden West College so that we can physically put on a test. As well as contacting our outside uh, third-party vendor for our, our written examination, which is basically a police report done on a video over projector. Another one to two weeks for grading those written examinations because they're graded by a third party that's also part of that same vendor as the written examination. 
Once they pass that, if they do, they move on to our outside oral board preparations. This can take anywhere from three to four weeks as we try to prepare three or four outside raters that aren't affili affiliated with Seal Beach so that they can rate our individual employees as they move on throughout the process. An additional one to two weeks for those grading of those uh, oral board results as well as the certification of the list by city staff. Another 30 to 60 days for a full background investigation. Another one to two weeks after that's completed for a polygraph examination. And then another week or two for their results to come back. Another one to two weeks for a medical examination. Another one to two weeks for a psychological examination. And lastly, another week or so for a chief's interview to get set up. To make a long story short, it takes four to six months to hire a lateral police officer. The same amount of time as it takes to put a police recruit to the police academy. Lastly, please think of, of all of the costs in this grand scheme of, of a police recruit versus a police lateral. Not just dollars and cents, but the ability to put somebody that we've invested our time with that there is no cost for. Because there's several, like I said, employees prior who are interested in the position. And if we're truly invested in our employees, why not give them the opportunity to prove themselves in the police department and become a police officer for the Seal Beach Police Department? That's all I have. Any other questions for you guys? We have the answer. I had the privilege of going to the groundbreaking of the Golden West Police Academy that they're building right now. It's just going to be absolutely awesome. I believe it's um, what, what measure M money that's going into that. It's, uh, they're going to make it almost like a village because so many of the things that our police are running into these days with the ambushes and, the, and all of the dangers that they're encountering out in our neighborhoods and they're going to be training them in actually like house-like things like they do um, in the Army. I think it's a wonderful place. It's been a great academy for many years at Golden West. Now it's going to be even more extraordinary. So, And thank you for a great presentation. It was very, very helpful. My pleasure. And it is a state-of-the-art facility. I was there as well, as long as the, awesome. a couple of police officers here, but it's very nice. Councilmember Moore, do we have any questions? Would this be an ongoing thing for, for the future? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. It is, it is our goal to have this option available. Like I said, we do have some employees within the city that are currently obviously interested in this idea and this concept. And I left one little bit out there is that if for some reason one of our current in-house employees aren't able to make it through the academy or do drop out, that's when the Los Al High School graduates and Cal State Long Beach graduates come apply. Because we'd like that ability to open it out to the general public if in the event we don't have somebody in-house that would be able to, to meet our needs per se. Does it increase morale, you think, to bring people from within? 100 percent. Thanks. You're welcome. Can I make one note? We uh, just recently lost a Dimitric uh, that worked in our jail. He went to Buena Park. We invested a lot of time in, and uh, he's a great employee. He's been with us for a significant amount of time working in our jail, and he went to Buena Park Police Department to become an academy recruit. He's currently in the training, and this position will allow us not to lose good people like that. Not always, but, uh, you know, that's what this is built for. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions? Uh, Member yeah, I, I just wasn't sure if I heard right or if you had answered. Uh, Robert Goldberg said something about if you, when your trainee comes back, you have to have them be with another officer for a year. So does that put us shorthanded if, uh, in that case? That's a great question, and no, that's not accurate. The reality of it is, is that when a police officer comes over, as a, whether it's a lateral or academy grad or a police recruit, directly out of the police academy. They are placed anywhere by post guidelines, which is our governing body for the state of California police officer standards and training, to stay with a police FTO or a police department field training officer for a minimum of eight to 16 weeks. Now that all depends on their experience level and things of that nature. But I'll tell you that one of the most recent hires we had that was a lateral took us 18 weeks and then decided to go to his other agency before. So it, it's kind of a variable. You never really know what you're gonna get. And that's why I talk about those things that you can't put a dollar sign on, which is our internal promotions from moving people within our organizations because we have the ability to determine whether their work ethic was great, 
we can go over, open up their background file and see whether their last evaluation was true um, to the facts, whether they were a great employee or a poor employee. So those are some of the benefits. But regardless whether we hire a lateral or a police recruit, their training period is anywhere from 8 to 16 weeks. And during that time frame, there's not another officer taken off the streets, and that person is not supplanting our current deployment. Our current deployment is set up so that even when we have, when, when we have an FTO or a field training officer with a police recruit or a lateral, that unit is still considered one unit. It's not considered two units, so the two units are in physically one car. In fact, what happens is that sometimes, depending on the level of experience or how well that they're progressing through training, that unit can sometimes handle our two-person calls because there's two people inside of the police car. But regardless, it doesn't matter if they're right out of the police academy or not. That one single unit is still considered one single unit and doesn't affect the rest of the deployment. One other question. Are sure. we having any trouble recruiting la laterals? or th So is this because we're having trouble recruiting laterals, or is it more... Uh, a feeling of knowing knowing the in-house better? I would say that it's a little bit of both. I wouldn't say that we're having a, a problem per se currently recruiting outside employee or outside employees, but for instance, I can't name the city, but what we're currently experiencing is trouble with other agencies uh, coming over to our agency because of certain things that are, are based on our MOU, and that's a whole other uh, Pandora's box. But in short, if like for example, this last police test that we had, we had three or four laterals from one specific agency. Two or three of those from that one specific agency withdrew because of different things happening in their organization. Now, I, I can't tell you that 100% of our applicants that we get as a police recruiter are going to be 100% successful. But what I can tell you is that on average, the, California, the state of California standards are that out of 100 applicants, only one is successful through probation. So that's regardless whether it's a police recruit or a lateral. So all the other figures, about 20% being able to drop out of a police academy, I can't give you factual data on that because I have no idea where that came from. But what I can tell you factually is that only one in 100 successfully passed police probation. Thank you. You're welcome. Wow, that's pretty stiff. It is. Thank you very You're much. You're very welcome. Have a good night. Is this a receiving file as well? Motion to adopt a resolution. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a motion to adopt the resolution? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, please vote. Five to zero. Okay, uh, there are no public hearings this meeting. Uh, there's no unfinished and continued business, but we do have new business, approval and issuance of a report on steps taken by the city since the adoption of Interim Urgency Ordinance 1662, amending regulations for accessory dwelling units in residential zones in the city to comply with new state regulations. Zone text amendment number 16-2. Can we have a staff report, please? Yes, Mayor. Thank you. I'll turn this item over to Crystal Landavazo, our senior planner. Crystal? Good evening. Um, thank you. Tonight's staff would just like to provide an update um, to a 45-day urgency ordinance and moratorium that the City Council adopted on December 12, 2016. Um, this was adopted in response to State Assembly Bill 2299 and Senate Bill 1069. This moratorium put, um, this, the urgency ordinance put new regulations in place to comply with new state legislation while staff worked to prepare a permanent ordinance. Um, since the December 12th adoption, the California Department of Housing and Community Development has issued technical assistance memorandums. Um, staff um, would just like to provide the council with an update that we will be coming back to the council at the January 23rd meeting to request an extension of this moratorium or so that we can have time to review any further documentation that's released by HCD while we are preparing a permanent ordinance that we can bring back um, to the City Council and the Planning Commission prior to that. Um, this is just a brief update for the City Council. If you have any further questions, um, staff's available. Are there any questions? 
I would anticipate HCD um, issuing quite a few letters of procedure for this uh, action that we're about to take. Uh, converting garages into living space becomes a real problem, but I think that the state is trying to ameliorate the decision they made, the bad decision that they made by passing this law. Um, so you think by the 23rd you're going to have enough information? I know we're on a, on a clock. Um, by the 23rd, we're going to be requesting an extension um, of what's in place, and we're looking for a 10-month and 15-day extension because we do also anticipate that there will, there will be additional information coming forward and more clarification. So we would like that time to wait and see what um, the State Department is going to issue prior to us taking action and adopting a permanent ordinance. The, the I'm sorry. sorry. The, 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 just to clarify, the moratorium ordinance that the council adopted is effective only for 45 days. Yes. And and so that's uh, I believe January 26th or 27th is the expiration date of that ordinance. So we've scheduled a public hearing as required by law for January the 23rd, at which the council will have the option of extending it for the full yeah. to, to get to a full year. And in that. In that period of time, uh, staff anticipates getting a more complete set of guidance from HCD as to how to go about implementing um, this new law, which sort of was sprung on us uh, at, at the end of the last legislative session. So that's the purpose um, for the public hearing on the 23rd. But prior to that, state law requires that the city issue this report that's before you this evening at least 10 days prior so people know what it is. Um, the city is doing in, in taking steps to comply uh, with that new law. So that's this uh, this uh, item is a compliance action in preparation for your public hearing on January 23rd. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Council Member Sistarczyk, you have a look. I, I did have a question, but I don't know if maybe I should just wait till the 23rd. It was it was about consistency. Uh, maybe I'll go ahead and ask it. Um, in in um, attachment B, the which is the original, I guess, it says that the property shall be the primary residence of the property owner. The owner must occupy the primary dwelling unit or accessory dwelling unit. Excuse me. In tonight's staff report, it has HCD also acknowledges that local agencies may require that an applicant order and recommends recordation of a deed restriction. So I just wondered why the staff report had this as a, a softening, it seemed to me. Um, staff's intention is to have a um, recorded um, covenant on the property. Okay. So okay. That the property I, I agree with that. So I was just, I was a little worried, that's all, when I read that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, our action then is to continue this to the next meeting. It's um, an approval action of the report and then a... Uh, okay, we're approving the report. That's right, that's correct. And, and then holding over for the 23rd, agenda. the J January 23rd agenda. Okay. So can I have a motion to approve this report? Motion to so approve. moved. Okay, second? Second. Okay, um, there is um, just one thing I'd like to adjourn uh, this council meeting to Monday, January 23rd at 5.30 p.m. to meet in closed session if deemed necessary. And also, if, if you'd just hold up a minute. And I'd like to adjourn this meeting also in memory of a woman that lives in Leisure World, lived in Leisure World. Her name was Pate, Kate Pettigo. She was born in 1911 in a horse-drawn carriage. She's known to have had adventuresome and a peaceful life, living to the age of 105. As a Leisure World uh, resident of Mutual Five, 
That's my mutual. She was honored by the city of Seal Beach City Council on the occasion of her 100th birthday and also her 105th birthday. Big party. Her, memor her memorial services will be held at 11 a.m. on Saturday, January 14th at Redeemer Lutheran Church in Leisure World. And she was a great woman and a magnificent artist. Mm -hmm. And it's a shame to lose her. Thank you. We're adjourned. <laughs>